Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we'll begin. I want to wait right till 12:10. What a great turnout! I, this is I'm very appreciative for all of you coming this afternoon. I know it's been a busy and active and fun and interesting and politically uh, compelling conference, and so that you're still here to talk about poverty and capitalism and issues facing our country, uh, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I'm Robert Doerr. I am a mortgage fellow in poverty studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where I focus on basically the large uh, federal programs and uh, uh, that, that have to do with low-income Americans, large welfare programs in the United States. Um, and before uh, coming to AEI, I was really in the belly of the beast, from your perspective and from my perspective as a conservative. I was the Commissioner of Social Services for Governor Pataki, and then I was the Commissioner of Social Services for Mayor Bloomberg. So I ran and was involved in and saw all these large well, uh, cash assistance, food stamps, Medicaid, child care assistance, earned income tax credit, all these large federal programs that are designed or intended, although they aren't always successful, to help low-income Americans. So I really was in the belly of the beast. Um, but I really was a conservative. The one thing about Governor Pataki, uh, and also true of Mike, Michael Bloomberg, regardless of what you may feel about their other positions on other issues, on welfare policy, they were really in the front row of people that wanted to implement the strong work requirements and child support enforcement requirements and other requirements that came with the federal welfare reform legislation in 1996. They never gave in on those requirements. In fact, they may have been the, as strong implementers of them as anybody else in the country. So in our world, in the world of welfare, the world that I came from and where I worked for, we were implementing, I think, uh, strong work-based welfare policies. Um, I have to say one thing just as a beginning. Um, I'm, this cold weather is really getting to me, uh, and it's just uh, it's awful. There's only one. I was walking the dog this morning and thinking, you know, this is just, I can't, I, I love walking my dog. And, now that I live in Washington, the neighborhood is nice and everything, but, but this cold weather, I just, I, I, want my, I want to have my wife take three turns for every one turn that I walk the dog. And, uh, but there's one little secret, uh, secret benefit to how cold it's been, and that is that as I walk around, I think, uh, well, each additional day of this cold weather, it's possible that the, the climate change fear mongers are oh, going to no. be found oh, to no. be no. less and less correct. No, they predicted this. Oh, they did? <laughs> okay, all right. They have an explanation for this. Well, anyway, it's not my expertise, but it's the only benefit I can get from how cold it's been. Um, so let me just say about the, the topic, how capitalism uh, empowers the poor. This is kind of self-evident. This is not complicated. Uh, for anybody that works in, in poverty programs or programs that help the poor, the extent to which the economy is growing and stimulating and producing jobs at the low end, in the middle, at the top, is good for low-income Americans. The more people who work, the less poverty we'll have. That's just a fact. Now, there may be imperfections to capitalism. There may be imperfections to our, our cyclical economy. We may have downturns where uh, we have uh, rough edges that need to be smoothed out. But all in all, let there not be any doubt that from, from someone who worked in the trenches and is, is trying to help people move up, that free market economy that is growing and producing jobs is far better for the poor than any of the other alternatives. And when the economy is strong, more low-income Americans are working, their incomes are higher, and poverty is lower. So there isn't any doubt about that. In addition, the stronger the economy, the more revenues, and this is not something we're, this is not all, there's not all good about this, but how do you think we're able to fund these programs that provide assistance that raise up the material well-being of the poor if it weren't for the fact that tax producing and tax paying Americans and businesses were providing that form of assistance. One of the things that I used to always do when I worked in New York, and I spent a lot of time working in poverty programs, but I always made sure that when I spoke to uh, uh, audiences that I thanked them. That I thanked them for the support that they provided to the to the government that allowed us to do some things well, some things not so well. But there isn't any question. We live in a generous country. Our economy, when it's strong, is producing revenues and opportunities for poor Americans. And those revenues and opportunities for poor Americans reduce poverty. It is, uh, the, there are not, it's not perfect. And I think as conservatives, as my, as my uh, new boss, Arthur Brooks, like to say, have to make peace with the social safety net. 
we need to acknowledge that there are going to be some people who can't work or elderly or disabled. And there we need to have some avenue of support and we need to acknowledge that. We also need to convey to people that we care about these issues and we care about the extent to which the economy is not producing jobs or opportunities and the extent to which whatever supports we have in place don't work effectively. If we write off those issues, if we act like that's not our game, that's somebody else's game, we give up too much terrain. There's a political objective, but there's also a policy objective. Because when we give up that terrain and we give the impression it's not something we care about, uh, then the terrain is won by the other side and policies get put in place that reward dependency and reward assistance and don't reward work or families and instead set people back. Not that they, they, are, they become not empowered, they become enslaved. They become captured by the welfare system in the United States which rewards dependency. So I don't think there's any real uh, uh, doubt about that in your minds and I don't think I need to make that case about the benefits of a strong economy. There is some debate in Washington now among economists about the extent to which our economy is allowing middle class Americans to move up from one generation to the next. And there isn't any doubt. There is some stagnation there. And, and uh, young people today aren't so sure they're going to have uh, an opportunity to have higher incomes the way their parents had higher incomes than the parents before them. That generational growth and opportunity, there is some concern about that. And there are a lot of factors in that. But that generally has to do with middle class and upper middle class or people higher up the, the, the political lane. Let's not make that discussion about poverty programs. Let's not make that discussion be about how the, the capitalist economy or the free market economy somehow prevents low income Americans from moving out of poverty. Because that's not right. That would be a misreading of that discussion. That discussion is about stagnant uh, uh, wages and, and earnings in the middle, and there are issues there to be discussed. But I'm here to talk about low income, people that are struggling uh, in a very serious way. And to the extent that our economy is producing opportunities and jobs, uh, the more the better. It is a fundamental truth of helping low income Americans that when the economy is stronger, they're in better shape. And one of the greatest, um, in my opinion, uh, disappointments of the current president is how long this recovery has taken to br bring relief to low-income Americans. So, for instance, we have now a significantly higher poverty rate than we had um, uh, in 2001 and 2002. President Obama has not reversed a negative downward trend in median wages for African Americans or for poor Americans. Um, only in the last year did it tick down a little bit and hap hopefully this year, as the economy finally gets to grow, it may tick down a little more. But all in all, the record of the current administration on not getting the economy going again has hurt the people who uh, he says he cares about the most. The poor, African American, city, people who live in cities, people who are really struggling. So I, I want to be very clear about the importance of the economy, but I also wanted to say for a moment, talk a little bit about uh, because I've been uh, influenced by all the politics in this building and in this week and all the activities here, I'm, I hope you don't mind a, um, a welfare scholar or a welfare expert uh, talking a little bit about what I want to hear and what you should want to hear from people running for president uh, when they talk about these issues. Because these are complicated issues and there are certain key things that I think we want to hear that we can know um, as they go forward that they'll take the country in the right direction when it concerns low-income Americans. Um, because, first of all, one of the things that we have heard, and um, I think for some in some respects the American Enterprise Institute and others, Arthur Brooks, other people at the American Enterprise Institute and, and leaders in Congress have really, I think, turned the tide a little bit on this, and that is Republicans should talk about these issues. They should uh, talk about these issues in a way that conveys to people that they are concerned, that they have ideas, that they want to help people who aren't uh, necessarily entrepreneurs or, or uh, famously successful capitalists. They want to help real people who have real problems, that they have a heart. Now, in saying you have a heart, you got to be careful not to say that a heart means always saying yes or always spending more. But we do have to say that we have a heart, we care, we're concerned, and we have ideas, and some of those ideas may be 
maybe involve saying no or being tough or being difficult, but they're ideas that have a better chance of helping people move up and into jobs. So that's one thing, and I think we've won on that. I think that you know you can't uh, you can't uh, turn a corner without running into another Republican candidate for president who says I'm going to talk about uh, uh, struggling Americans, that I'm not going to make the mistake that Mitt Romney made uh, four years ago. So that's 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 okay. That's a start, but that's not enough. It's not enough. So from my standpoint, the very first thing that I want to hear, and I think all of you might want to hear when they talk about these programs is we need leaders to endorse work requirements and expectations in return for assistance. We learned when we reform welfare that if you make clear that receiving assistance from government requires a reciprocal relationship between the recipient and the government, if you ask able-bodied people seeking assistance that to go to work, they will. Too many of our federally funded program assistance programs do not have a real work requirement. They should, and candidates for the presidency should say so. So let me take you through that. The most talked about in some circles program, and the one you hear about a lot, is welfare, cash welfare. Some people call what all assistance programs welfare. Let's just talk about cash welfare. That's the old AFDC program that became the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program after President Clinton signed welfare reform. That is the program run through states and cities that provides to people in need, usually single mothers, a cash check. A check that when they are put on assistance, they get on a monthly basis. It's not a lot of money in most states. It's not a lot of money in any states. But it is a cash uh, transfer, direct and, and clear. When we started welfare reform in New York City in 1996, there were one, more than one million New York City residents receiving that cash welfare, men, women, and children, households that were getting that benefit. And there was no work requirement. After we reformed welfare and imposed a strict work requirement, 30 hours a week of engagement every week, that someone who was receiving uh, that benefit needed to be at a place doing something that either looked like work or was on its way to work it, or, or was uh, uh, actual <coughs> volunteer work, um, a workfare type program. We've, because of the implementation of that fundamental requirement, the cash welfare recipient caseload in New York City when I left at the end of last year was down below 350,000. 1.1 million, 350,000. Because we implemented a requirement that people seeking and receiving assistance needed to be engaged in activities on a daily basis. Now, what do you think happened? What do you think that was about? Do you think they weren't working and they came in and they were told they had to go to work and they ran out and got jobs? Yeah, yeah that's happened. Some of that happened. But the fact of the matter is they were working already, some of them. That there were, there's a whole economy in the United States that, that supported people in some various kinds of activities that were legal activities, although off the books. The fact is these folks who people had said could not work, would not work, weren't capable of working, were working and could work and did go to work. And the number one statistic that shows that, and this happened across the country, not only in New York City, but across the country, was the labor force participation rate for never married single mothers rose from below 50% to over 60% in the United States. Tremendous increase. And all of the liberals and all the academics that had studied this issue for all of those years had never seen that kind of change that dramatically in such a short time. And welfare reform work requirements made that happen. Saying to someone, if you want assistance, we will provide it, but you need to show something as well. You need to step up. And, and one of the, um, I didn't think it was ironic, but my, some people might call it ironic, but one of the great things about that was I, uh, most of this happened in New York City through a large welfare agency called the Human Resources Administration, which had offices all over the city. People would come in and seek assistance. And was in, the people that worked for th that agency, which I ran, um, overwhelmingly Democratic, largely African American, Hispanic, largely women, majority women workers, um, came from the communities where welfare recipients came from as well. They were the strongest supporters of work requirements in the city because they did it. They got up every day and went to work. They showed up on time. They worked uh, and they expected and they did not understand why a government assistance program shouldn't also expect from able-bodied people seeking assistance that they go to work as well. And that was a real transformation 
that letting them communicate that importance to the people they were trying to serve led to a real transformation in the city and led to a real transformation, I think, in the country as well. So when you hear politicians running for president talking about doing better for the poor or working on these programs, I urge you to listen for the word requirement or expectation in other programs besides TANF. So that means food stamps. That means Medicaid. That means housing assistance. These are other very large programs which provide an enormous amount of assistance to low-income Americans that do not have a work requirement, a real work requirement. And when uh, uh, politicians say that, that will engender some pushback because the other side will say it's an entitlement or that's food or that's health care. But the fact of the matter is if you say to someone in this relationship in government, we want to help you, but you need to also help yourself. We need to know that you're seeking work or that you're in work or that you're moving toward work. And the only way we're going to know that is if we see you at a place at a certain time on a certain day. This is extremely important. And let me tell you another reason why it's important. It's not important to be just to be tough or to fulfill a societal expectation. It's important because people that come to these offices and say, I only want food stamps or I only want Medicaid, but I don't want cash because I don't want all that hassle. Um, food stamps isn't very much. Medicaid is just health insurance. Families can't live on just that. So if they're saying they have no income, it, I think it's an obligation on our part to say, well, what's going on? What's happening in your household? What can we do to help you make income so you can flourish on your own and be independent? To say, as I think the liberals would say, no questions asked, let's give you your assistance as easily as possible, no hassle, I think is a mistake. Now, conservatives might say, well, that sounds like more caseworkers or more work for government workers. One thing I want you all to be clear about, the cost of these programs is in the benefits. It's not in the staff. It's not in the workers. It's in the benefits. So uh, a food stamp giving uh, Medicaid is health insurance. That goes to hospital and doctors and, 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 and uh, providers of health. Food stamps, the, co the cost, the $70 billion in cost, is overwhelming in benefits. So to the extent we can help people no longer need the benefits, by helping them get into work, we are saving significant dollars. So requirements, expectations of people receiving assistance. We want to hear that from people running for president if they're going to talk about helping low-income Americans. We need to hear that. If we don't hear that, we may be just hearing kind of, I care and uh, you know, it's not really going to change the system. I'm not going to really fight for things that will really help low-income Americans. So listen for requirements, expectations. Another requirement expectation, a little more complicated and a little more um, maybe controversial, not to me, is what's called the Child Support Enforcement Cooperation Requirement. Sounds pretty bureaucratic, pretty uh, heavy, but when you apply for cash welfare, that first program that has shrunk dramatically, there are two requirements we impose as a country on it. One that you work, and the other is that you cooperate in seeking all the form of assistance your family should be expected to have as an individual, as a citizen. And one of them is a contribution by the other parent. So the mom seeking assistance with two kids at home, we want her to go to work, and we want her to help us find the uh, other parent and engage him in having a regular, not a, uh, commiserate with his earnings, but a regular payment so that we can relieve her need for assistance by getting financial support uh, and help her support her children. Poor uh, single parents who receive child support collections, that is people who are poverty line or below, who get child support collections, it turns out they amount to 45% of their income. So it's a significant source. And as a, as a, as a parent and as a, a husband, as a, as a, as a, a, a child of, a, of my family, I know it takes two parents to raise kids. Sometimes it takes two parents to bring them enough financial. And most importantly, people should not be allowed to have children and walk away from any financial support for them. We need to say that, that, that and, and again, another issue that frankly we're not talking enough about. Because re remember I talked about uh, the requirement, the reciprocal relationship. So in cash, you must work and you must cooperate with child support enforcement. 
the applicant so that we can help you get the other source of income for you and your family. No child support requirement in food stamps. No child support requirement in Medicaid. No child support requirement in housing. No child support requirement in child care. That's not right. We should be saying to people who seek assistance, we need you to do all you can to support your family. And two of those things are work and engage the other parent in providing support for you and your children. We cannot allow that to go unattended to. So when you listen to politicians, listen for requirements, expectations, reciprocal relationship between the recipient of assistance and the um, provider of assistance. The second issue that I think we, we all want to hear has to do with something called work supports. So it's a, it's a fact. Sometimes low-wage workers working even full-time need more assistance to support a family. Uh, that's just a fact in the United States. They're the cost of living, the fact that wages at the bottom end have not grown that far, households with children, even with child support collections, it's sometimes not enough to allow them to move up the poverty line. Republicans who run for office need to make a distinction between provisions of assistance that support and reward work and provisions of assistance that don't. And the ones that support and reward work, that make wages go further, um, are things that I think we should be willing to accept. That they are part of the social safety net, as Arthur Brooks says, that we should make peace with. We believe in work. We believe in people earning their own success. Sometimes that effort to earning their own success cannot be achieved unless we provide some form of assistance. So you're going to hear about the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a large refundable tax credit. It costs a lot of money. Big federal program. I think it's the biggest anti-poverty program. It exists now, and some Republicans are talking about making it even bigger by extending it to childless individuals who don't have children in the household. Large cost. The reason they are saying that is because it rewards work. It encourages work, and work is the first principle to helping people move out of poverty. The question we have to ask ourselves is, in doing that, is it tailored so that it's targeted to the people most in need? Or is it going to end up being another program that is broad-based, just like the Democrats wanted, as much assistance for as many people as possible, but doesn't really go to the people most in need? But my main point is that I think when you listen to Republicans running for president, you should hear about and listen for we are, are, are accepting of programs that reward and encourage work by providing a little more assistance to make wages go further in a targeted, disciplined way. That's point number two. Point number three. Leaders need to always talk about family. The need that children have for two active and involved parents all the time. We at AEI just produced a, a major report on the extent to which two-parent married families is good for kids, it's good for moms, it's good for dads, it's good for our country. And Republicans, or anyone running for president, Democrat or Republican, cannot be afraid to say that. We cannot be afraid to say that kids do better in two-parent married families. They just do. It's the facts. It, 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 there is 25 years of social science studies from the left and the right that have shown that in every kind of measure, performance in schools, involvement with the criminal justice system, job, job opportunities, graduation rates. Kids in two-parent married families do better. It is a false promise for a politician, Republican or Democrat, to say that he has got an idea from government that will overwhelm that uphill battle that single parents face at, that, that will correct it, that will smooth it out. And politicians do it all the time. They say, well, I'm going to do this, and it's going to make life better, and we're going to see how things get better. But they never say that it will only do some, but it can't do the whole. It cannot replace a father. It cannot replace a second parent. It cannot replace the benefits that come for children of two-parent married families. And I, I live with this in New York the entire time I was there. This, is, this kind of issue is not uh, the sort of thing that New York politicians normally feel comfortable getting into. But it was so apparent that, that in every one of our challenges, whether it was in schools or in welfare policy or jobs or, or child welfare, that the, 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 the failure to be honest with young people 
and our, and our community about the benefit to children of two involved and active parents, preferably married, was doing great damage. We were not being truthful about what the facts are. Now, um, in New York City, at the very end of the Bloomberg administration, we did a public uh, uh, service announcement campaign around these statistics, just around the statistics. We want kids and young people to know that outcomes for children in these households are not as great. And they ought to, if they're going to make decisions about their future, they need to be aware of uh, what uh, is in store for them. So leaders who are running for president need to be talking about family. Let's be honest about it. Um, Senator Santorum, of course, had the great the statistic he, he used. I use it as two. If you graduate from high school, get a job, and get married before you have children, you have a 92% chance, 98% chance of not being in poverty. It's true. All three are important. The job is the most important. But postponing having children until you're married, understanding that children need two parents, is extremely important. The fourth issue um, is uh, a fiscal issue. Um, and I, I want to be, uh, I want uh, us, this one is, is harder because I think this one people won't really face up to as directly as they should. So we've talked about welfare policy. We've talked about uh, these large federal programs, these efforts on the part of the United States over many years to help poor Americans, which have not really all that been that successful. But when you look at them, Medicaid, food stamps, cash welfare, housing, Child care, child support enforcement, those are the big ones. By far the biggest is Medicaid. It is, so in New York City, and I don't think these numbers are different from the way they are around the country, federal, state, and local spending on the program to provide health insurance for poor New Yorkers was $30 billion a year. About half federal and half state and local. $30 billion a year. Food stamps was less than two. Cash welfare was less than one. Child care was less than 500 million. So we're just not even in the same ballpark when we talk about the large health care program for the poor, Medicaid, and the rest of, of what we do. And often what happens is politicians like to, like to use big numbers and show how expensive programs for the poor are, and they lump them all together without making that differenti differential. And I can understand that. You know, there are lots of reasons why we would use rhetoric in sorts of ways. But I ask you to be aware. The program that is risking our nation's fiscal health, the program that is spending all the money on the poor, is the one that writes checks from the federal government or from the state governments to health care providers and to health care insurance plans. It does not write checks to people. It provides them with health care. That's true. But all of that money does not go to their back pocket. And it's very hard. It can be done, but it's very hard for an individual poor American to rip off the health care system with their Medicaid card because they'd have to get sick in the first place. Um, there are scandals in Medicaid, but they don't involve poor Americans. They involve health care providers. And um, I like health care providers, but we need to be honest about that. And we also need to be honest about the fact that if we're going to have any fiscal health in the long term, we have to figure a way to control the cost of Medicaid and Medicare. They are by far, uh, uh, in the world of helping low-income Americans, the biggest uh, a threat. These other programs we talk about, small potatoes. Savings there won't have that much of an effect. If we can solve uh, uh, Medicaid, if we can figure a way to uh, better control those costs, uh, then we have real hope. So when we listen, and again, this may be so esoteric and so detailed and so specific. People that run for president don't like to get too specific. But when they do, and they talk about savings in programs for the poor, they're going to have to face up to the Medicaid problem. Fifth, and this is the last point that we want to hear, and this goes back to where I started. Um, leaders must commit to doing all they can to getting our country's economy growing at a faster rate. 
When I was working in social services in New York City and New York State, it was a common practice of people in my business to ignore the other side of the politician's house, the other side of the issues, the guys that were involved in tax policy or economic development or transportation or things that affected the economy. Um, big mistake. Because if, if people that care about low-income Americans think that the only way to help low-income Americans is to fix the, wel fix the welfare program, they will fix the welfare program maybe, but if the economy is still going in the wrong direction and not growing, poor people will suffer and poor people will struggle. So this comes back to the original point. When it comes to politicians talking about the long-term growth of our country or talking about how much they care about low-income Americans and that they want to do something for them, they need to have an economic plan that creates jobs and that has a chance to really grow the economy in such a way that we can increase the opportunities for people. Because capitalism is the best system for the poor. It is, offers the best opportunity to move up. It offers the best opportunity to uh, escape poverty. It's why so many low-income people in the rest of the world come to the United States. Um, and that's all true. But if the economy is growing at 2.5 or 2% or going backwards, the people that suffer the most are not the wealthy folks or the upper middle class folks or the well-educated folks. They're the people at the bottom. So the, the, the plans from the president have to be that. I have no doubt a Republican candidate, the candidates that have come by here in the last few days, they certainly are going to have a, a commitment to that. But, but we need to be conscious that though that is an important ingredient to improve our country, not just for the vast majority of Americans, but for Americans who are struggling the most. So that's what we want. So those are the words we need to hear from leaders who seek our support. Will they push to require work in return for assistance in more federal programs? Do they support targeted and properly set up work supports for low-income working Americans? Will they always talk honestly about the limitations on government's ability to make up for the absence of a father in a household? And finally, do they have an economic plan and agenda that will get our people back to work so they can earn their livelihood, not be dependent on government assistance to provide their material needs? The last point I want to make is about the, the, the term poverty and the measurement of poverty. And, and I'm glad everybody has the book, because some of this is covered in, in the book. But one thing we, you, we, can, um, we can be proud of as Americans is that through our generosity and our um, maybe our well-intentioned uh, purposes, we have and our and our prosperity, we have been able to fund a series of programs and other initiatives that have raised the material well-being of people who uh, aren't working or are struggling. And so, when we look at the poverty measure, be aware that it doesn't count all of the supports we provide. So, people that are classified as poor are materially far better off than they used to be. And there's nothing to be ashamed of about that. We've helped people have the things in housing or in, in material needs or food that allows them to have a minimum level of existence. But what we haven't done is what they really want, and that is to earn their own success, to live in a society that asks of them and helps them move in to the, to, the, to the greater uh, prosperity that comes from work and moving up and raising a family successfully. So we've raised every people who are struggling material uh, well-being. And I'm not saying they're living large, but they're not what they were once. And that's, I suppose, good. But we haven't really helped them the way we want most to help them, which is allow them to work and earn their own success and care for their families in a way that's going to benefit their children uh, and the future of our country. So um, maybe that wasn't what you came for, uh, a conversation about capitalism. But those are the things I urge you to hear, uh, hear, uh, listen for as we go into this campaign. Um, those are the things that are important. Um, those are things that I hope we uh, have candidates who speak about positively in just that way. Because if we don't, we're going to continue to have Lots of assistance that raises people's materials well-being, but doesn't really help them the way they need to be helped.
So with that, I'll stop and take questions and any comments anybody has. Thank you. I just wonder how does, what does uh, working for welfare, I worked for the federal government and back in, I guess, the day of Clinton, we did the welfare back to work yes. and mothers. Yeah. And in our case, it wasn't too successful. We had about four different ones come in, and each of them was a head case. <laughs> well... The, uh, again, the, the story of the welfare reform legislation in 1996 was that President Clinton had some interest in it, but really had to be pushed. He was pushed. Uh, he ultimately signed it. He vetoed it twice. Um, but I have to tell you, I worked in, in the programs before, and I worked in a very liberal state, New York. Uh, when the federal government says that uh, cash welfare is no longer an entitlement that people have a right to, and instead, we are allowed to put requirements on people receiving assistance to show up someplace every day or go to work or be engaged in work activities. Um, that was a tr big transformation. And as I say, New York City is 8 million people. We had 1 million people on cash welfare in 1995, 1996. And due to the leadership of Giuliani and Pataki and the federal government, we and uh, my predecessor, Jason Turner, we totally transformed that. And so what happened was that a lot of people who were taking advantage of a system that allowed them to receive assistance without working but were able to sort of skate realized they're holding me accountable. I'm going to go to work. And so they were the real heroes in some respects because they stepped up. And sometimes we forget that, that we didn't, government didn't place them into jobs or give them jobs. They went out and got jobs because the government told them they had to. Now, there are people who that isn't enough. And they, they, and when I talk about the 350,000 on cash welfare in New York City, those folks are having real trouble. And, and it may be temporary trouble. It may be trouble for a while. And I am not saying that everyone is able to uh, jump right into the labor force on day one. But I am saying if you run a program that treats them as if none of them can, none of them will. So I don't know what happened in other states, but generally, the welfare caseload uh, dropped dramatically all around the United States. The block grant for cash welfare, I can't imagine what it would have been if we had not changed that um, uncapped stream of money to the states, which was the old AFDC program, where you got more money the more people you got on assistance. Can you imagine what that would be now if we hadn't done that? By making a cap, you know, it never really increased. It's still only about I think uh, $20 billion a year, so it's a, and, and the liberals hate it now because it's so small. They say, look at this program, it's shriveling up, it barely, but the idea was to have less people on assistance, not more. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea behind it. I'm just wondering if we'll ever really get going. Well, the, uh, the, I think, it, but what happened, and this is what's frustrating to, to me and to so many of us, is that people in the federal government and the states just shifted to another program that doesn't require work. So SNAP, 47 million people, $70 billion. When I started in New York City, and I have to admit, I, I was part of this. There was less than a million recipients. When I left, there were more than two million. So, you know, there was this growth. And the justification for that growth was that it was a work support, that it was, and sometimes it is. And sometimes it goes to the people that are senior citizens. And the federal government promotes it and sells it and tells people they should be on it. And they made it much easier to apply. And once you're on, nobody asks any questions for a year. All of those things changed because the unrelenting drive of some parts of our political culture to just increase the amount of flow of cash out to people without expectations. Medicaid grew. Other forms of assistance grew. The earned income tax credit. But so we still have a welfare problem in America. I don't think we have a cash welfare program the way we used to. Yes, ma'am. What do you do about the, uh, I love the notion of work for your benefit, but what do you do about those who aren't skilled or don't have skills to take to the workplace to get that work? Well, the, the, uh, that's a very good question and concerned about skills. So the, there was a long history in academic research about training and education programs for people applying for cash welfare versus work first programs. And the evidence was conclusive going up to welfare reform was the training and education programs had no better success, in fact less success, in getting people jobs 
than the programs that said we need you to go to work right away. Um, so uh, there's a really open question about whether government can successfully run programs for adults that try to get them the skills. Now, especially in conjunction with a cash benefit. So what we found was that, first of all, there are, um, we, we would prepare people for the skills that they needed at the entry level positions that were available in the city of New York, and we were not embarrassed by that. We didn't cre call them dead end jobs. We didn't call them hamburger flipping jobs. We called them jobs, and we called them opportunities. And again, when you combine the wage with the work supports, they're much better off than being on cash welfare. And we insisted that people seek them. So, and when it came to sort of their job wasn't maybe available, we said, well, we need you to be in a certain place at a certain time every day this week, and you'll get in the habit and the expectation of showing up and being in a place because that's what work is. And that is a fundamental skill, learning to be able to do that. And that's what we did. We had the largest work fair program in the country. Um, I don't know what's happening to it now under Mayor de Blasio, but it was the largest. Think of that, you know, New York City, liberal New York City had the largest work fair program in the country. Um, and it was, and I found that people will then, a lot of people will step up. I, I was going to, I, I mentioned this in one of the articles. I, I, I do feel I should have pointed out as well. And, but this is, no. everybody should know this. You can't ever run a program that doesn't say to people, we can't really help you unless you're willing to help yourself. And you're, we really, we have to say to folks that the key to your success is you. Now, we can help you, but if you think I'm going to solve your problem, then I think we got a problem there. And too much of what we've done in government programs and what I think liberals do is they convey to people that they will solve the problem without them having to step up. So we, we, and also the other thing about the American economy, and this is a little bit of a down, uh, I've got a, <coughs> New York City had an abundance of entry level jobs. Tourism, hospitality, restaurants, um, uh, custodial services. And we were always able to get people into those opportunities. Um, and when, the, when we knew the economy was really struggling is when, um, Higher skilled people are being forced down into those kinds of jobs because they can't find the things that meet their skills. That's why we need a strong economy so that we can have an abundance of opportunities. Yes, sir. Um, what are your thoughts on negative income tax rates for the tax credit for people in the country? Okay, so the history of this is that um, the negative income tax comes without any requirements. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the, the lots of people, including AEI scholars, have just said, you know what, just give them money. And let it be, you know. Walk, let them figure it out. Let's send them fifteen thousand dollars a year or ten thousand dollars a year, and let's do away with all the fuss. Um, I don't think that works. I, I think that, and also I think that offends the common sense judgment of most Americans. Uh, and while it sounds very nice in an economics class, um, it doesn't uh, in, get people to work, uh, and it, it leads to kind of a dependency. Um, and I also should say that as Republicans, we had this fight. President Nixon and people around him tried to do that. And do you know who was the leader, you know, from the Republican side of, of not negative income tax? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan said, no, no, we're going to have a workfare program. And even on the left, I was reading a history book the other day, that, that they, the, all the lefties tried to get Robert Kennedy to endorse this sort of minimum existence, just throw money at people and let it, and not worry about it. He never would accept that because he did not believe we should have a system that didn't require people to work for themselves. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned Lincoln struck the uh, highest cost in terms of welfare is the Medicaid with the health insurance. Right. What did uh, the Affordable Care Act do in order to bring costs down? <laughs> it strikes me if you were going to create a new program, provide assistance to now everybody, right. you would bring those costs down. That would, wouldn't that help? Well, I, I am not AI's or anybody's health care expert, so I need to say that clearly. Um, um, and uh, I have been pleased, leaving the Affordable Care Act out for a minute, that even before the Affordable Care Act, the, the annual increase in health care costs for programs for Medicaid that was going at, you know, 9 and 10, 11 percent every year has slowed. 
And so that the demand on government for Medicare and Medicaid and the demand on the health care and all of us for the cost of health care has not grown quite at the rate it used to, which is good. Every, every little bit it grows sl slower is savings for us. Um, President Obama's people like to say that some of that's due to their efforts, that they've done some things in, that are in the Affordable Care Act that are driving that. Um, I think that, I have to be honest about that. I think the, the jury's out on that. I, I think that the classic Republican answer, because it has Obama on it, it must be bad, um, may not be true in this particular case in some aspects. And I'll give you an example. So one of the things that the Center for uh, uh, Medi Medicaid and Medicare, CMS, the large federal agency that controls Medicaid and Medicare, has done a lot of lately is audits and investigations and um, challenges to providers for overcharging. Um, they've, done, they've used data to uh, evaluate billing patterns that reveal that in a community where the demographic, in other words, the age and, and and income status of the people that live in that community, you would think that in normal times there would be 20 of this kind of procedure. And for some reason in that community we're getting 500 of that kind of procedure. And when you see that and you begin to say what's going on here with the healthcare industry billing practices, they have pressed that a little harder than had been done in the past. Some of it started with President Bush, but they have definitely done that. Another thing, I don't know that all of you have seen these, but this series of articles in the Wall Street Journal where journalists and others have gotten access to the billing data in Medicare and called attention to the, the concerns about overcharging and, and disproportionate billing in certain kinds of procedures or by certain providers. I think that's had a good effect. Um, there are other things that are uh, in Obamacare that I think have pushed people toward managed care and uh, paying for results as opposed to procedures that I think maybe aren't so bad. Um, but the big thing they did was they increased the number of people that are being provided a subsidy to pay for their health care. And the question is whether that huge expansion of the number of people that will have the government supporting their ability, and they force them to buy products they might not want to buy, which is sort of another fundamental issue. Those questions, I think, are really a problematic. So they've expanded the entitlement state. They've limited freedom. Um, and maybe it they've done some things to control costs. So I will take the third, and I'd like to give back the first two. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, so this is a controversial question for conservatives because conservatives that I know get very uptight about government mandates about what you can and cannot do with your, the money in your pocket. And I do too. And with Michael Bloomberg, I never liked the bans on Big Gulp. I, I get that. I, I didn't like that. I didn't like taxing, increasing taxes on sodas. Not something that I was comfortable with. But SNAP is a benefit program. We're giving you $300 a month to use to buy food. It's a government program program that's called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's supposed to help people in need buy food, nutritious food, for their families. That's what it says it is. That's what it advertises itself as. And yet, because of a, of a deal made in 1965, where the food industry said, we will always support more SNAP if you never put any limitations on what people can buy. And so the poverty advocates said, I'll take that. It'd be nice to have you know all the big food industries always there for us whenever we want to increase SNAP. They're powerful people. They, they have significant political influence. And you know, we're, we want our poor people to be able to buy whatever they want. And so that rule in SNAP means that when you get the EBT card and 46 million people are in the households that have the EBT card, you can go to the grocery store and you can buy whatever you want. You can buy Coke and Pepsi, 
which is not healthy and not nutritious and causes obesity, or you can buy nutritious foods. And the government has done very little in even running a successful education program so that people know what is going to last longer through the month or um, be healthy for their children. So when we were in New York, I, we had a commissioner of health, now in the Obama administration, who said to me, the only health issue in America that's getting worse every year, and we don't know what we're doing about it, is obesity. Is that, and, and obesity costs. It's driving up Medicaid costs, driving up health care costs, and it's hurting people. It's a, the principal cause of type 2 diabetes. So I said, well, and I never liked the fact that we don't send stronger messages to people who are receiving assistance about how we want them to use their assistance. So we jointly wrote a proposal to, that would allow the city of New York to experiment, first time in the country that's been allowed, with limiting the use of the EBT card to buy just uh, sugar and sweetened beverages. $100 million a year before this, it's much more now, $100 million a year was spent using SNAP benefits to buy those products in New York City back in um, the early 2000s. That's a lot of money. And you could still use your EBT card for anything else. And you can use your own cash, which we know people that have EBT also have, to buy the sugar and sweetened beverages. An odd little detail about uh, Coke and Pepsi or sugar and sweetened beverages in, in the use of EBT cards is you're not allowed to charge a tax of any kind on anything that someone buys with EBT. It's tax free. So you and I, maybe who don't have EBT, we pay more for Coke than people that have EBT in New York because they don't have to pay the tax. So we proposed this idea. Michael Bloomberg is a great health fanatic. He wanted to do it. Uh, we got the governor of New York, Governor Patterson, a Democrat, to support us. We got other politicians and health, health people. We could get none of the anti-poverty advocates because they never want to say to anybody in need, no, or we're going to tailor this. And so they would never support us. And we sent it down. And the Obama administration was considering it. And we had Secretary Vilsap come and see the mayor. We advocated for it. We told him. We had our health care commissioner show him a map of New York City that showed where was the highest levels of, of childhood obesity and where were the highest levels of SNAP use. And they were overlapped. And we made an argument based on health, health for poor children. And the Obama administration wrote us and said, no experiment, no pilot, no test, no. So my view is, even leaving aside the business about whether we should do this nationally, we should at least test it. You will hear from uh, people in Washington about evidence-based policy. This was an opportunity to do something to see what would happen. You could still buy Coke and Pepsi with your own money. You can, but they said no. So we're not doing it. Similar proposal was made uh, some years ago by Governor Pawlenty in Minnesota. It also got rejected. My position is, is that we have this huge program that provides an enormous amount of assistance to struggling people, which I think does a lot of good. But it does not do enough on helping people uh, make better decisions about what they purchase for their families so that it will go further and will be more nutritious. And it calls itself the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So yes, I would like to experiment with that. So you think that should, that should be a... I think that, that the, what I would like to see is a test. I would like to see it tried. I would like to see the USDA finally allow a state or a place to say to people, now, we're getting way into details here, but just so you know, there is one other group that gets a little tense about this, and that are the grocery store owners. 80% um, of SNAP benefits are paid for using the, 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 um, the technology. It's not hard for them to classify a product as being eligible for SNAP and not eligible for SNAP. They do it already. Much of what's in a grocery store is not eligible for SNAP because it's paper or other kinds of products. But food and certain kinds of food can be classified one way or the other. I noticed the other day when I went to the store that when I looked at the screen that they showed at me, they actually had a different category, EBT eligible, not EBT eligible. So they know how to do it. But so yes, I would like to see that. I think that uh, we're wasting a lot of money trying to help people buy nutritious foods on foods that are not nutritious. The other issue
Yeah. Well, that's a hard question. The um, and I'm I'm the the typical liberal response is that there should be no stigma or no negative feeling to being dependent or seeking and receiving assistance. None at all. Um, I tend to think we should do what's right, and if sometime some kind of re feeling about that emerges, we shouldn't run our program entirely to avoid that. Um, having said that, having run the food stamp program in New York State, the EBT card is um, a huge advancement over the old paper vouchers, um, uh, just for ease and applicability and efficiency. Um, but uh, no, the, the current administration has gone to great lengths to promote the receipt of assistance. Um, and I have some reservations about that. Yes, sir. Well, that. <laughs> well, I don't think I did a very good job of countering that today. That's for sure, because uh, I, I spoke on things that I was more comfortable with. But my view is is that is that we actually have not done a very good job in showing, especially at the bottom end, the extent to which. Um, employment and wages lead to uh, higher incomes and less poverty. And I know that it's there because I've watched the cycle affect poor people. Um, but we, we need to get that data solid. We need to show um, the extent to which better economic policies um, uh, lead to greater prosperity for the poorest among us. And I ne we need to work on it. That's a real challenge for us. I think the reason why we have such a problem with that is because to many Americans, the only thing Republicans stand for is tax cuts. And so that immediately leads to, well, it's just about cutting to, and, and as we all know, more wealthy people pay the bulk of taxes in the United States. If you're going to cut taxes, you're going to end up cutting their taxes. So I think, um, and God knows, I don't want to get into tax policy. What I, what I do want to say is that if we're going to support tax cuts of any kind, like, for instance, the corporate tax rate, the leading argument should be, and we have a paper at AEI that shows this, should be that a corporate tax reduction leads to higher wages for entry-level employees. Um, and I think we need to do more of that. We need to show as explicitly as possible the extent to which tax policy that allows for greater freedom leads to greater benefits for the lower part of the income scale. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the, the center is still a work requirement of 30 hours a week, and I get Obamacare reduced 30 hours, and it's like Obamacare oh. uh, so, sounds like we, we bump into each other right there because you're not going to do it. Well, that's a very good one. The, um, I, I, just uh, uh, anecdotally, I, I, I was just in uh, Staples, and I talked to them, and they said they're on two Yeah, the effect of Obamacare on employment uh, hours has been shown to be negative, and that people have, and that's a problem. And I acknowledge that. And uh, that's they, the Obama people have said, well, that means people have more free time, or they have, they have. <laughs> but but it is it is uh, it's 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 the 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 complicated issue about these programs is what's called the marginal tax rate. So if you provide work supports to low-income, wa low-wage workers to make their wages go further, like I said we should in some cases, then the question is, well, if I work more hours or, I, or I, I'm willing to take a higher-paying job, I'm going to lose some of my benefits. That should happen. I, I mean, that makes sense. If your income rises from earnings, your, benefit, your need for benefits should go down, and we should reduce. But it can't be... It can't be for every dollar you gain, you lose a dollar. You want to have it tapered. And that is where President, um, uh, not President, uh, 
Chairman Ryan's proposal yeah. for an opportunity grant comes in. He's trying to get away from that marginal tax rate problem so that yeah, states. Yeah, I was just talking about the hours problem. And yeah. Yes, the same thing. And then a related problem, Chuck, is with people in the workforce. Now that they're pushing up the minimum wage, isn't it going to knock out these unskilled labor? Yes, the minimum wage increases. Is a very, I've always spoken against, we had a, policy, a procession at EITC, the minimum wage increase, a mandated federal minimum wage is not in any poverty program. It doesn't, it hurts the poor yeah. because it lo limits their opportunities. It hurts the people that are struggling the most. Um, and. So I am adamantly opposed that, and they're wrong, and they're not going to get it, I hope, and, and I hope we keep it that way. Now, I'm getting a signal from the back. I'm happy to talk later. Just, just, just one, sneaking in one more. Yes. I understand Florida put in a drug test requirement to get your cash welfare. And what do you think of that? Because <laughs> Um, I, we never had a drug test in New York. We had a mandated, what's okay, called, I, I, I'm not so hot on drug tests for welfare, uh, for public assistance. That, that is one that I, it's very hard to implement. It's a costly. It's in, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not all that comfortable with that. But that's not to say I shouldn't ask people about their drug situation. Yeah. Yeah. They help get them off drugs. Yes. One reason they can't hold a job is they're drug addicts. That's right. This was all very nice. Thank you very much.